What the heck? No, I did not buy a boat. This is my brother's boat and he took it to a boat mechanic and it's still having problems afterwards and he asked me if I would look at it. And I said, I don't know about boats. <laughs> sure, bring it down, I'll see what I can do. So the main thing is uh, it's not starting. He says it makes a horrible grinding noise when you try to start it and the mechanic told him that he shimmed the starter. I assume that's messing with the spacing where it bolts on. Uh, not something I've ever done before. Said when he did it that it probably wouldn't last very long and sure enough it didn't. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, you ought to be able to make the starter work correctly and last a long time. That's what they do. I'm gonna tear into this. I don't know uh, if this is gonna be video worthy. If it's not, you wouldn't have seen this. If you're seeing this, then there was something interesting. So let's get to work. Normally if I want to back in, I just pull up there, but I've got a wood pallet in the way. So I pulled further down the hill and it's so muddy I can't back up. So a little bit of a pain, but we'll get it in there. All right, here we are inside. Needs a little cleanup, but actually the boat's in pretty good shape. But it's an inboard outboard. I've worked on outboards before. They're easy to, well, much easier to get to everything. Never worked on an inboard outboard. So, yeah, hopefully this will be an interesting experience. There's your air filter. It's not really a filter, it's more of a screen. Just over full, which probably where they filled it to. This is a Mercruiser 7.4 liter, eight cylinder, it's a V8, and uh, it's 454 cubic inches. I didn't realize it at the time, but this is the classic Chevy big block 454 engine used in all sorts of vehicles, pickup trucks. It's just modified for a marine application. So my understanding is getting to the starter is tough. Yeah, I think it's tucked back in, like kind of right back in there. Well, I'd really like to get the batteries in and crank it over just to see what it's doing. That's sort of the first rule is demonstrate and verify the problem but, you know, this is my brother. Uh, I'm pretty confident that there's going to be an issue here. I'm waiting to talk to him about how these batteries go in because uh, there's two different batteries. I'm not sure which side goes where. Anyway, I'm going to start ripping stuff out of the way. Got a wire connection down here. Into that. Let's see, maybe I can just take this panel off and be able to leave the wires connected. That'll do it. You know, this thing is just needlessly in the way. I think I'm going to take that off of there. I think I can see why uh, his mechanic was complaining. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you can kind of see the starter there. There's a bunch of junk in the way. I'm gonna have to do a fair amount of disassembly just to really be able to get it. But before I do any of that, I do want to get these batteries in here. Oh, I am gonna hit my head on this thing. Endlessly. I 
Now, for the record, in a car, you have to be a little more careful because you've got a grounded chassis, and that's why you always do the, you disconnect the negative first that disconnects the chassis, then you disconnect the positive. Because if you disconnect the positive while you're sitting here wrenching on it, if you bump a piece of metal, you're gonna have a direct short from the negative, the chassis, to your, your positive. Well, here, everything's fiberglass. There's nothing around me that is uh, essentially negative. I just have to not touch the other side of the battery. And even with this battery hooked up, this cable goes straight to a disconnect, which is off. So even though I've got these other hot wires, they are not hot right now. So yeah, this is actually pretty easy. All right, so batteries are hooked up. So now all I need to do is put, turn this on. That only connected one of the batteries, but uh, no smoke. All right, now they're both connected. See that. Haven't let the smoke out yet. So now I should be able to crank this thing over. Uh, yes, the engine would need cooling if it were to start, but uh, I'm not going to start it. And this thing's been sitting for over a year. Uh, my brother said you'd have to put some fuel in the carburetor and do stuff to, to get fuel to it to even hope for it to start. So it won't start, but I, it will crank or it should crank. So let's see what it does. Ooh. Well, that doesn't sound good. Ugh, that's hideous. That sounds like completely stripped Bendix. Let's see. The starter is right there. Now you can see where the battery cable's going. My assessment is there's something wrong with it. I mean, that sounds horrible. It doesn't sound like it's just not engaging. All right, now we gotta try to start ripping and tearing and get that starter out of there. This is gonna be fun. And this is not gonna be easy, um, but this hose and this hose definitely need to get out of the way. Yeah, it took a little doing. That hose just goes down to the bilge pump. So this line here is just right smack in the way and i'm pretty sure that's a coolant line now of course there's no coolant in this it uses the water that it's running in so it's just going to have water in it so i'm going to try to take that off okay all right there is the starter and uh, <laughs> I think the bolts are on the bottom. All right, we are going down with the endoscope. And I'm looking back up at the starter. And yeah, there you go. Bolt there and there. But yeah, we'll pull the starter out of there and then hopefully we'll be able to get a look and see what's going on. That horrible grinding noise. I am gonna hit my head on that thing a hundred times before this job is done. Every time I try to come out of there, I hit my head. And I can actually see that one. Hey, that wasn't even tight. And they've put it so close to the, uh, the side that you can't get the, the ratchet on there. Just by feel, I'm doing the yeah, the other bolt wasn't tight either but not loose enough that just tightening it is going to fix it but weird that they're not even tight this is going to be fun to put back in
set of control wire is yellow with a red stripe. Oh, okay. Starter is out. I hit my head yet again. Here's the flywheel. You have a much better view than I do, but what I can see are some little bits of metal, but the teeth don't look bad. It's just like the, the gears were not engaging. I feel a dish right there, like the Bendix was coming out, but there's still teeth left. It's like it wasn't, um, wasn't engaged enough into the flywheel teeth. And I think I see what he meant by shimming. Why did he shim it? These are the shims. They were between the block and the starter. All right, I'm a little confused. Shimming it brought it down from here. And that would have disengaged it from those flywheel teeth. And you can see that they were barely engaged. That area where it ground off, it didn't even take off all the teeth. I think it shouldn't have been shimmed, but that's just my first thought. And he must have done it for a reason. I need to look into that more. Obviously, those bolts not being very tight didn't help anything either. And obviously, right now, those teeth barely engage with the flywheel where it is. So, moving it some would be a good thing. Hmm. I better bar this engine over and make sure it's not locked up. If it ever lands in this position again and he gets that bad noise, he's going to have to bar the engine over a little bit to get the flywheel to mesh at a different spot for the starter. Right here is the crankshaft. You should be able to rotate the engine right there. In fact, I'm going to do that in just a minute. Make sure this thing's not locked up. Holy cow, engine's locked up. I wonder if that's just because it's been sitting because the starter's broken or if that's the reason the starter broke. Using foot pounds. Well, that ain't no good. Standing on this, and I mean that thing just feels as locked as it can be. I tried both ways. When I go left, it actually was loosening the bolt. When I went right, it tightened the bolt more than it was, and uh, I'm afraid I'm gonna break the bolt off if I go any harder on it. I know it's a big engine, but it really should be moving under that much force. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull the plugs and look in the cylinders. So the plugs are perfectly accessible. Way down under here, right there is the plug wire. So, and then one here. Nice. Of course, there's a hose right in the way. But I'm going to pull the plugs out and we're going to scope the cylinders, see if this thing's maybe hydro locked. I'm looking at it with the carburetor sitting right on top there. If water got down in there, it could leak right down into the intake manifold and in through the intake valves right into the cylinders. So I talked to my brother and asked him the story again. So supposedly this thing, supposedly, you know how it is trusting customers, I mean brothers. Um, <laughs> no, supposedly this thing ran great the last time it was used and it was then winterized, parked for the winter, and the next spring when he tried to start it, that happened. It just did that grinding sound, and that's been it ever since. That was a couple years ago. But what I'm wondering about is if it didn't, while it was sitting there over winter, if it didn't get water into the top, which would go in through the intake manifold, and then hydrolock it, which forced the starter to strip those flywheel teeth. And the starter is more a symptom of the problem than the problem. He says he always stored it with something covering the engine. You know, tarps leak. So it's possible, unfortunately, that it just leaked into the wrong spot. Look at that nasty plug. 
That looks like it's all covered in rust. Let's take a look. So this is cylinder number eight, and you can immediately see lots of rust on the cylinder walls, and that's water sitting right there. That is down. Uh, the scope is not oriented up to down. And it looks like a lot of rust from condensation on the top and bottom of the cylinder wall. Next we're going to cylinder six. This is the right side of the engine, so all the even numbered cylinders are over here. And you can again see that there has been a lot of water sitting in here, but much of it is gone. Uh, there's several water lines and then a whole bunch of rust sitting right at the bottom where the piston and the cylinder wall are down. That looks awful. This is one of the worst ones. Here's cylinder four. It is uh, almost all the way up and there's not a whole lot to see, just kind of light rust everywhere. And here's cylinder two. The piston is also almost all the way up on this one, uh, but this is one of the best looking ones of the bunch. And here's the slam dunk, cylinder seven on the other side of the engine. And I orient the scope so up is up. And there, that is water we're looking at. And I'll prove it in just a second when I rock the boat. You know what they say, don't rock the boat. Because maybe you don't want to see what you're about to see. <laughs> that is not what you want to see inside your cylinders. I also got a quick look at the valves and one is open. I would bet that's the intake valve. Here's cylinder five, lots of rust, little bit of water. It's scary when that's one of the better ones. <laughs> cylinder three is most of the way up and so there's not a whole lot to see and it's hard to get a good view, but there is a little bit of water sitting in it. And finally, cylinder one, Pretty good view of this one, a little bit of water, uh, <laughs> but one of the better ones. So I'm gonna try to blow out cylinder seven with an air compressor. And make a big mess. Can you guys even see what I'm doing? So let's see. Well, I don't think you guys can see anything anymore, but... And after blowing it out, this is what we look like. At this point, I'm thinking this engine is probably going to need a complete rebuild, if not just scrapped and replaced. But I wasn't ready to give up just yet. I'm going to work a little longer and see if I can't get this thing freed up. What I'm going to do now is pry on the flywheel teeth, because that'll give me more leverage than, uh, than trying to do it right here at the... Uh, at the crankshaft pulley. I don't expect it's gonna work. And then I'm gonna flood each cylinder with ATF and let it sit. So right down there, you can see the flywheel. I'm gonna stick a pry bar down in there and see if I can't get it to move a little bit. And I'm gonna leave the camera up here where you guys would be able to see the pulleys turning if I am successful. Cranking on it pretty hard, it is not budging. All right, I'm gonna squirt ATF on all the cylinders. All right, so this has been sitting here for a day with ATF, automatic transmission fluid, in all four cylinders. Let's see. Nothing. So I have an idea. This is from my leak down tester. That plugs into a spark plug hole. That hooks to an air hose fitting. So the cylinder all the way back this way the piston is at the top, so I may be spinning the engine forward or backward depending on where it is, but I don't care about that. I just want to use the air pressure to help push that piston down and help me try to get this thing to turn over. So let's screw this into that hole. All right, I took my wrench off of that because if this thing starts spinning, I don't want that wrench to go hit something. Here's our air hose. Let's hook some pressure to it and see what it does. Ah, shoot. One of the valves is open on that. Not on the compression stroke, so that's not helping us. I need to find one that's on its compression stroke. All right, so this is the companion cylinder to that one. This one should be on the compression stroke. Still leaking a lot. Nothing. 
So I've got one that's holding pressure. Um, I need to be careful here because if it starts to spin, this wrench could get uh, thrown with some force. But So this piston is holding 120 PSI of air, pounds per square inch. And the cylinders are four and a quarter, which comes to 14 square inches, which equals 1,700 pounds that that air is pushing down on that piston. No good. Okay, rather than giving up just yet, I don't feel like I'm able to put enough torque on it to really try to, to crack it loose. I feel like if I could just get it moving a little bit, I could work it back and forth. Every movement, every bump would break up some of the rust and maybe I could get it to turn over. That's my thinking. Using a breaker bar on that felt very inadequate. I took this pulley off. I took all the belts off to get them out of the way. And then I made this. This is a piece of three quarter plate and it's got the same hole pattern as the, the pulley bolts so that I can bolt that on. There, now I've got a bar on there that I don't have to worry about breaking anything. And I can really torque on that thing. So put an extension on it. And let's give this thing some coaxing. Pulley moved a tiny bit, but I'm also moving where I'm bolted on. I made the holes a little big so that they would have uh, some play so that they could get to the right spot. And if you're wondering why I didn't put this thing straight up and down, it's because that's still in the way. And that means removing the whole water pump. Pulley's moving a little bit. Whether that means the pistons are moving or not, I don't know. Huh. Is that moving? It sure is. Wow, I know it's moving because my little air pressure hose here now has ATF squirting out of it. All right. that range of motion much better now. So I took that off because it's interfering with that. I'd rather not take the water pump off if I don't have to. So I've just gone back to the breaker bar on the central. And uh, it actually is making progress as I go back and forth. Oop, except for that.
All right. Well, I must say, uh, I had uh, thought that this was a lost cause and almost abandoned. Well, I was still trying, but I wasn't real hopeful. That's why I didn't film any of the building of my crankshaft turning wrench. I need to modify this thing so that I'm able to spin it past that. See, with it like it is, it just hits. And it's a triangle, so if I can go 120 degrees, I can just unbolt it and rebolt it and go again. I think I'm just going to bend the piece of rebar. Let that cool off and then we'll go get this thing to turn over. So I chased the threads on the bolts, now I'm just chasing them in the holes so that I can get a good, a good attachment here. Yeah, working on boats is, uh, <laughs> it's like a challenge of your character because everything is so inaccessible. Not all boats, outboards aren't too bad, but uh, this thing, this whole engine is set down in this hole. You've got this much room and uh, you can't even get to the spark plugs. It's like a game of twister to take the plugs out. This was a big help. I was able to swing it 120 degrees and then rebolt it on and do it again a couple times. And then I went back to the breaker bar now that the engine's easier to turn over. Well, that was a 180 degree turn right there. A 360. That is two full revolutions. We have a free engine. So let's take a look at a couple cylinders now. This is number seven. This is the one that had standing water in it. And I mean, it's got a bunch of oily junk and still some ATF in there. You'd expect with just you know this engine's maybe been turned over like three times at this point so yeah but really huh, that doesn't look too bad considering let's look at this one this is number five And here's number three. None of them look fantastic, as you would expect. You know, what I'm seeing looks reassuring. I think this thing's going to run. How cool would that be? I was thinking this thing was scrap for sure. Here's a look at cylinder six. This is the one that looked the worst. It had the big pack of rust on the bottom. And you can still see a lot of rust, but uh, it certainly looks a lot better than it did. Remember with the boroscope, things are magnified. They actually look a lot worse on the scope than they would look with your naked eye. So I now have the enviable task of putting this starter back on. The bolts have to come up through the bottom, way down under there, where you can hardly even see, let alone reach. And, well, yeah. Oh, I thought I dropped that 
nut. So you can't really see, but I'm putting the bolt up through the bottom and holding the bolt in place and the starter with one hand, putting it in position, and then trying to start the threads. Surprisingly, it works. Getting this bolt in the other hole totally blind. I'm fighting for every quarter turn. That is a fun place to work, let me tell you. Well, shit. God. I despise that thing. I've hit my head on it a thousand times. Feels that way at least. So, in theory, we can now crank this thing over with the starter. Plugs are still out. I wanna just blast as much stuff out of those cylinders as I can. So right under here, right behind my finger there, is the output of cylinder six. Yeah, we'll see how much comes shooting out of this thing. Let's see if it'll crank. Why would it not crank? So I had neglected to hook up the main battery to the starter wire. That'll do it. Let's crank. You know, we might actually save this thing from the scrapyard, which is a uh, pretty darn rewarding. I feel I should mention I wasn't actually done. I mean, I had kind of given up on hope, but I was gonna keep trying some things. And if my custom crankshaft pulling wrench had not worked, I was thinking about trying to get the ATF out of the cylinders and then filling them with evapo-rust and just get, get that rust off of there chemically and then try again. If that didn't work, I, I think I was done. But um, yeah, I mean, don't give up. This was probably the worst looking one of the bunch and it still looks pretty rough. Ugh. The thing is, as long as it doesn't get between the rings and the cylinder wall, it, the damage that it's done has already been done. So I think if we start getting some comp um, you know, basically a power stroke in here, a gasoline explosion, and then high pressure getting shot out of the exhaust. I mean, that stuff isn't gonna stay in there very long. It's gonna get blasted out. I guess I'll crank it with the starter a little bit more just to loosen everything up as much as I can. And then I'm gonna put this thing back together and try to fire it up. play some twister getting these plugs back in there. Uh, I seriously doubt it comes across on camera how inaccessible everything is on this. You know, a car feels inaccessible, 
but you can reach above it, you can reach below it, a lot of times you can get down beside it. This thing, I don't know, it's worse. I did check all the gaps, they are all 35 thousandths like they're supposed to be. Okay, the plugs are in, that was a battle. I don't know how long that took, it felt like two hours to put in eight spark plugs. <laughs> plugs are in, wires are hooked up. I do not have uh, water on the, the lower unit intake yet, so I can't run it for any extended period, but I can run it for a few seconds and see if it's going to fire. Instructions from my brother are to dump about two ounces of fuel right down the carburetor. And even if it does start, whatever's in the tank is several years old at this point, so I don't know how well it's going to run. But at least it's got a little bit of fresh fuel. And I guess we're ready. Is this thing going to fire? Hmm. Doesn't sound real happy. I wonder how the voltage is on those batteries. I would think the two batteries together would be okay. Yeah, let me, uh, let me check the voltage on our batteries. 12.4 volts. Let's see what it is while cranking. It's not that bad. It's spinning slow. All right, I got a jump pack on it now, too. Let's see if that makes any difference. Uh, let's do this. Starting to wonder if we have spark. All right, so here's the deal. It's the next day, I charged, and we're sitting at 12.8 volts now, so that's an improvement. And I talked to my brother, he says this thing's always hard to start after it's been sitting. Now it's going to be even harder with cylinders that are full of ATF and junk. So um, I'm gonna do what he suggests before I start all the engine troubleshooting. He said, dump some more fuel in the carburetor, and we're going to give it plenty of throttle, which I was not doing yesterday. But all right, let's see what it does. It just doesn't seem like it's cranking well. It seems like it ought to do better than that. Now that starter might be damaged from what we, you know, from it trying to spin a locked up engine. That could be the issue. So he says there's no choke on this thing, but there's got to be a choke. And in fact, I think this is the choke right there. It looks like it's actuated by that shaft there. Uh, that shaft is turned by this right here. This is an electric actuator of some kind. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up a, a little alligator clamp to the starter solenoid so that I can start it here just by touching a wire to the battery. And that's going to allow me to manually choke the carburetor. It's going to allow me to spray starting fluid into it and uh, see if we can't get this thing to pop off. I suspect that the water came in right there. Went right down through the carburetor into the intake valves and into the cylinders. So if that's the case, the bottom of that carburetor may be full of water and um, that's what we're up against right now. Yeah, I messed with this a little bit and something was just stuck. So it is choking now. Yeah, see, it sticks open. But before I tried to move it, it wouldn't move. Yeah, it makes me wonder. I may not have spark. Nothing. No spark. So no spark got me thinking. Uh, I had this problem on a boat, my own boat in the past, where um, it had one of those things like it's on a jet ski. 
you have to have like the wrist thing on and the button pressed or it kills the spark. Basically, it, it won't run. I've looked it over. There isn't one of those, but I did find that off run. What do you bet that's it? Let's see. Ooh, makes a horrid beeping sound. Glad I'm back here. Seem to be having starter issues now. That's lovely. All right, I'm barring it over a little bit. Get that flywheel in a different position and see if the starter will crank it. That's painful. Full disclosure, the first time I put the starter on, I neglected to pay attention to the plug wires and I trapped them behind the starter uh, like this. So off camera, I've already taken the starter back off and redid the wires um, because they were getting pinched. So I've taken that starter off and put it back on twice now. I don't know what to say here. The starter bolt sheared off. So the starter has rotated away from the flywheel and that's why it's not doing anything. But you know, I tightened that with this wrench, which is maybe eight inches long. I made it as tight as I could because it was loose when I first put it in. I don't think I overcranked it, but uh, yeah, I think it's just gonna need a new bolt. The problem is I have to take the starter off to get the stud out and that could be a nightmare. Hopefully it's not buried way up in there. Goodness gracious. So this is why boat is a four letter word. The stud is up inside there. I have one shot of being able to get this out. Basically trying to go right up the center blind with a left hand drill bit is probably the only chance I have of getting that thing out of there. There's just, there's no room. I can't even get two hands on this thing at once. Unreal. That is just a horrible place for that to happen. If I can't get it out with a left hand drill bit, I mean, there's no chance of me welding in there. Yeah, uh, it's pull the engine. That's that's the fix <laughs> for the broken bolt. Unbelievable. All I want to do is crank it to start. And this is like, I'd rather the starter broke. This is like the worst possible problem. Nope, I'm not even going to be able to get a drill. <laughs> can't even get a drill straight under it. I have to pull this engine. This is the lowest profile drill I have. That's a 90 degree attachment, but it only takes hex shanks. I'm going to see if I can drill this, if I can get a little bit of a hole in there. I then have these hex extractors and that one I ought to be able to tap in there and then potentially unscrew it. That's what I'm going to be working on. I'm way down in this hole. There is no chance of me filming this. So uh, I'll see you back. So here's the update. I'm getting little bits of metal out. I'm get the horoscope here and you can see by some miracle I'm actually drilling it relatively up the center totally blind see if i can get a bite on it with the screw extractor i'm gonna go this way i don't think i'm deep enough yeah you guys are in the way okay i just put the easy out in and i tapped it in 
and I started turning it. It's actually working. Holy crap. <laughs> Unbelievable. <sighs> if that didn't work, you're talking about pulling the engine because of a bolt. <sighs> I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go run to the store and buy a lottery ticket. I'll be back. Starter bolts can be somewhat specialized with varying shanks uh, compared to just a standard bolt. I wasn't able to get the actual starter bolts locally, but I did pick up some new bolts. These grade eight bolts are much stronger. And uh, I don't think with a box end wrench, you know, that's seven or eight inches long, especially with how hard it is to get my arm in there to even get any torque on it. I don't think there's any chance of me uh, breaking these bolts off. So let's go put the starter back on. And I've gotten pretty good at putting this starter on with one hand. I can tell you that's a skill I never wanted to learn. <laughs> starter is in. I still have a couple spark lights on there just to confirm. 90% sure that having that switch in the run position was my issue with the spark. We should be able to turn it over. So the starter does not seem happy to me. The good news is we did have spark, so I can take these lights off of here. I had taken these shims out. I guess I'm gonna put them back in and see if the starter's happier. My concern is that if the teeth are less engaged, when it gets to that point on the flywheel where it wore it down, it's gonna wanna stop cranking. Maybe inertia would carry it across that spot. Don't know. Maybe I should just put one back in. I went ahead and put both shims back in. It's only 30 thousandths that it was shimmed. Let's see if it turns over better. A little better. I'm gonna crank this thing. I just wanna see it spark. I have an ignition tester right here. I just wanna confirm that I've got a reasonable spark. We're definitely sparking. That's interesting. It built oil pressure just while cranking. fired a couple times. Does it just need a new starter? Because I've got good battery. I've got good battery voltage and it is just cranking slow. Now it could be all the oil that's in the upper end of this thing is just making it hard to crank over, but I don't really know what to do about that. Um, I crank this thing a lot with the plugs out. Okay, so here's my thinking at this point. I actually suspect in a very likely place that the water got into this thing is right through the carburetor. And there's a bowl kind of under this thing. I've never had one of these apart, but I can look down in there and see fuel. So what that means to me is there might be a bunch of water down in the bottom of this. And if it's sucking water into the cylinders, well, obviously it's not going to run. Yeah, I've dumped fuel in there, but uh, I, I need to get the carburetor off, see what's going on, and uh, probably clean it up. The other thing is, is once I take this off, I'll have direct, direct access to the intake, spray starting fluid straight into that, and hopefully get a different result. It smells like reasonable gas.
Yeah. Yellow stripe on top, black on the bottom. I don't think that's all fuel. In fact, it looks like there's a rust ring there. <laughs> Here's some of the nastiness that came out of there. I just want to see if it'll even burn. I mean, if that was gasoline, yeah, at least it's flammable. Now, of course, I just dumped fuel in there. That's probably what's burning. Uh, the rest of it, I think, is probably just water. So I let this uh, settle, and it did clear up actually quite a bit. And I do not see water line. I think it's just old gas. It doesn't smell right. Um, it doesn't smell totally like varnish gas either, but that's probably because I had dumped quite a bit of it in there. So I probably put 60 cc's in here, and what I drew out totals uh, like 250. So the end result is I'm not really sure what to make of that. That boat's been sitting there, hasn't run in at least, I think, three years. Huh. That doesn't look too bad. It actually smells reasonable. Uh, he said he put fuel stabilizer in there, so I think that might be okay. So I just blew all the gas and everything off of there, um, and I need to have a fire extinguisher handy. In case there was a backfire, this whole thing lights on fire. I am going to go clean out the carburetor in the shop while all the, the fumes are dissipating before I do anything else here. Yeah, I've never worked on a carburetor like this before, so I'll probably do some stupid things. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I turn it over, it wants to dump fuel, and now that I'm ready, it doesn't. Just a little spring clip. Did take all the bolts out, didn't I? Tappy tap tap. Why doesn't that want to separate? Because it's never been apart before. What I'd really like to do is get everything off of it that needs to come off in order to do a uh, ultrasonic on it because this thing could really use it. Yeah, so this is a Weber 9780S. I'm going to go do some Googling. I'll probably be able to find a YouTube video of someone tearing down this carburetor. When in doubt, get someone else to tell you how to do it. I did find similar ones, and I think I must be missing a screw somewhere. But I don't see one. Yeah, the other guy had a, two screws on the bottom. There is nothing on the bottom. down through the top so that just hooks on that those are a heater those two wires heat that up over time so the choke will open in a short amount of time but that could not go through the ultrasonic Open says me. Look at that. I think this thing needs cleaned out. And that's got to move, and it's totally stuck down there. Let's 
Here's a lead hammer. Go ahead and take these out. Just to see if there's some screws hiding down in it. What I don't see is any bolts. Could that be it? Does that need to unscrew? It's possible. That was long enough. Turkey. And there we have it. Two floats. In the, in the bowls actually don't look too bad. But uh, all this out here looks horrible. I mean, this is just full of rusty, nasty junk. So that really makes me think that the cause of water getting into this engine is right here through the carburetor. Where is all this coming from? Boy, isn't that nice. Yep, just stuck in there. <laughs> Good looking stuff. Little spring. There's got to be more than that, though. Oh, yeah ball. So that's a little check valve. Jets here. So half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half. Just under two and a half. Could use a little cleaning up. That's exactly the same. One half, one, one and a half, two. Two and a half, three, three almost a quarter. Just under three and a quarter. That was a little better. I can see the holes for the jets look good. I'll clean that out and then I'm going to go ahead and ultrasound this like it is. And uh, we'll blow it all out and hopefully that'll do a good job with it. So now that I've got this cleaned out, if I put it back in, it does move, and it moves to wide open, but then I think gravity is going to pull that to, clo well not closed, but partially closed, and if you open the throttle and the engine's really sucking hard, then it's going to open. So I'm not sure exactly what the purpose of that is, but it certainly was not working before. Yeah, I don't want that going through there, this has got a rubber seal on it. Don't want to hurt the seals. Let me just take the seal off. It's actually quite easy. It's facing down the open. Nothing in it. Needle. Needle looks good. Floats are nice and clean, so I'm not going to ultrasound those. And these needles have a little bit of rubber on the end, so I'm going to leave that be. I can see that's wide open. Yeah, that's wide open. 
Now this gasket, if I can get it off of here I would like to, rather than running it through the ultrasonic. So I've used degreaser in the past, but it does tend to, it'll eat away at the aluminum a little bit. So I'm just going to use dish soap, but quite a bit of it. While that's cleaning, I'm going to see if I can get this thing to fire off with some starting fluid. Goodness gracious, this is a real shit show. So what happened there is somehow my uh, jumper wire that I'm going from the solenoid control to the battery, it shorted right here on the battery post at the solenoid to the control. So it was going to keep cranking no matter what I did until I ripped that wire off of there. Just took me a minute to realize what was going on. I think the starter just landed on that spot on the flywheel where it doesn't have anything to grab. If I turn this, it'll probably turn over. All right guys, stupid mistake. This whole time I've been cranking this thing, I've had a meter here checking the battery voltage. It would drop a little bit, nothing bad. Well, I just checked the voltage at the starter and it was dropping to nine volts, which is way too low. So the only thing I haven't checked is behind there. Ugh. So this is a battery disconnect that hooks to two batteries and it allows you to use either one battery or both together or just turn them all off. But the way it's set up, all the current that comes from the batteries has to go through this switch. Yeah, those connections look fine too, but I don't think I'm getting the juice through this that I should be. So this is one battery in, this is the other battery in. This is the wire going out to the starter. So let me summarize a little troubleshooting here. I'm just checking the voltage on each individual battery and the black battery on the right, as you're seeing it, has 13.3 volts. It is definitely the better battery. So earlier when I checked the voltage at the batteries, it only dropped to like 11, 11 and a half. So now I'm checking it at the starter. Let's crank it and see what it does. It goes straight to nine and then it hits that bad spot on the flywheel, man. This thing is testing my patience. I don't think the starter being shimmed is a good idea. Let me bar it over and we'll try this again. Yeah, I'm going to nine volts at the starter. So this thing is not giving me enough juice through it. All right, there was not room to hook them all together, but I've got the big battery with the higher voltage hooked directly to the starter. I've got the other battery where it was, and I still got them linked together. So whatever current can go through this can come from the second battery, but this is a direct connection now. Well, ten and a half. Didn't sound all that much better. The, the lead fell off, that's why it's saying zero now. Man, this thing, this, this boat is cursed, man. All right, I am going to take this stupid starter off yet again and take the shims out. I don't think shimming it helped and it keeps slipping on the flywheel. So let's do that.
All right, that's as good as she's getting. It's not perfect, but uh, you know, it's so much better than it was. So I did not ultrasound these because the gasket stuck to them and I didn't want to ruin that. But I am spraying carb cleaner through everything and blowing it out real well. And it actually seems to be in pretty good shape. I don't see anything uh, totally plugged. Dirty screen there. Get a bit of junk in that actually. Can you see the schmoo? Let's get that cleaned out. Cleaned up nicely. This screwdriver barely spans that. Bet you this one will do a little better. I'm gonna put a little bit of light oil. That is one clean carburetor. Everything's moving real nice. And the choke, which was stuck, now operates uh, really well. Down inside here, this thing was totally stuck. That's free now. I think the carb is good. The question is the starter. All right, new starter's on its way. So I got the new starter. I don't see any difference. I was hoping I'd see a difference on the ohms. Uh, you know, you ohm across the, the motor windings and I get 0.6 ohms on both of them. So, yeah, I don't know. And here's a sketchy bench test, which for what this is worth, looks fine. Bendix gear comes all the way out and it seems to turn over fairly aggressively. Let me change this over to the new starter. Bench test number two. If anything, I would say it sounds a little better, but it appears to be doing the same thing. Whatever, let's throw it on the boat. We'll see what happens. If this doesn't work, I'm gonna have to pull that engine. Oh. All right, so the, the new starter came with new bolts. So that's a grade eight bolt, same as those. Now what's interesting here, you know, this is a 3 8 with a 3 8 16 thread, but this actually measures 390. It's bigger than 3 8 but it is a 3 8 16 thread. You can see how it necks down there. So if I use the regular 3 8 bolt, there's quite a lot of play in there. And if I use the correct bolt, there's still a little play, but not nearly as much. I'm going to use the new bolts. So these are stronger, just as strong as those, and stronger than the ones that broke previously. All right, moment of truth. Now, it's not going to start. I don't even have the fuel pump hooked up. But let's just see if this thing will turn over or if it's the same. Contact. I think it sounds better. Not grinding or anything. So yeah, 
Let's try to start this sucker. I have hooked the fuel pump back up. I put a little gas down the carburetor, ready to crank this thing over and see if it's gonna fire off. Now I can't run it long because there's no cooling right now, but I just wanna know, should I put the cooling on there and actually try to run it? Let's see. thought it was going to go for a second. You know what? That's not really a fair test because the carburetor bowl was empty. Totally empty. I probably need to crank that a little more. All right, let's try again. Well, the starter's better, but it's still just this engine. Man, it must be really hard to crank. All right, I've got that voltmeter on the starter itself, so it is seeing 12 and a half volts right now. Let's see what it's getting while we're cranking. Woo! Did you hear what I just heard? And it only went to 10 and a half, that's not bad. All right, I think I need to go get the cooling set up. I think we can make this thing go and hopefully once it runs a little bit and works itself out it'll be easier to start after that so uh i always called these muffs but basically the intake for the water is right here so this goes on that and goes right over it you turn on the water and uh basically it simulates this thing being in the water and allows the cooling system to draw water up through it so Let's turn the water on and uh, really try to start this thing. Put a wire there because it, uh, it's not wanting to stay on that well. And if that thing comes off while I'm running it, engine's toast. So let's not do that. So very close. Starter's only a little bit warm. I'm gonna give it a break. I'm gonna go get lunch. We're gonna come back and we're gonna start this thing. was so close. Now even with all that starting fluid, I don't want to do anything. You know what I haven't done is clean the distributor. <sighs> Come on, man. I just want you to run. I'm not even hearing a pop. All right. All right, I've got my ignition tester on the wire that's going to the distributor from the coil. So uh, I wanna make sure that I've got a good strong spark there. I didn't see anything. I mean, that should be sparking. Seriously, <laughs> no spark. <laughs> this thing is like a whack-a-mole, man. <laughs> Fix one problem, boom, you got a new one. <laughs> All 
right, well, I tested between the coil to the distributor and I had no spark there. So the distributor would not be the problem, most likely. Still wouldn't be a bad idea to clean that up, but uh, I'm gonna take this coil off. This is the primary coil, and this should be, I think, like from one to five ohms. And I'm getting 0 0.8, 0 0.9, one. That's probably okay. Positive to the secondary coil, and this should be like 5,000 ohms. Oh, nice. And I have an open circuit. <laughs> coil went bad. Right then. I mean, I already tested for spark and the thing almost ran an hour ago and now the coil is shot. Unreal. Whack-a-mole. Since I'm going to the store for a new coil, I pulled off the cap and rotor. I'll get new ones of those too if I can. All right, we're back from the Napa. Yeah, see I'm getting 1.6 ohms on the primary. And then we go positive to secondary. Well, I'm still not getting anything. Let me try a different meter. Secondary, oh, it's giving me a reading. 10 kilo ohms. Well, that's annoying. Well, will this thing not give me kilo ohms? Well, what's this one? eight and 1.8. So the numbers definitely look better on the new one. I suspect I'm going to get a better spark, but uh, boy, I thought that was open circuited, but my meter was fooling me. Come on, fluke. <laughs> this is a Thysindy. <laughs> yeah, and I was going to get a new distributor cap and rotor, but they did not have those in stock, but these look pretty good. I'm just going to clean them up. They should work fine. want to verify that I've got spark coming from this coil now. <sighs> yeah, so I looked up the specs and surprisingly this will only measure up to 4,000 ohms. Um, I've never had a meter that limits you like that. I mean this goes up into mega ohms. That led me on the wrong direction on that coil unfortunately. I'm going to write on this thing, but I probably won't forget that. Okay, I'm sitting here doing some troubleshooting. I have verified that I have 12 volts going to the coil, and the other side of the coil is not grounded. That's how the signal is sent to the coil. It grounds it, which grounds out the primary coil and sends a spark down the secondary coil. And I was getting ready to do a, um, to try to simulate the coil working uh, by grounding it myself. And in doing so, I was checking for a good ground on the block, and I found this nice bare bolt there. And I've got the other lead on the negative post of the battery. I've tried both batteries, by the way. I get the same answer, 32 ohms. That is not a good ground. And you think, well, maybe that bolt's no good. So let's take the other test lead and try a different bolt. Hmm. That's a good ground. In fact, it's connecting through those just fine. I love that beeping. Yeah, that is a good ground. That's going right into the block. And um, I don't have a good connection between the block and the battery. Now, I guess I'm pretty happy about that because that's probably the only issue going on here. The thing is, is the ground is I'm trying to get you in a position where you can see it 
it's that rusty bolt right underneath that hose that won't move out of the way because of course it is so i'm gonna go stick my head back in this hole again and fight with a bolt and get that cleaned up and get the engine block grounded properly and i bet you this is gonna work man i hope the gift that keeps on giving all right i tried loosening it and it broke that said, there's still, it's like there's another nut there. So maybe I can loosen that and unscrew that from the block. That would be nice. Oh, I think it's coming. Look how dirty that thing is. I put deox on both sides of the Connector, of course it's in a position where you can't reach it. There it is. All right. All right, so I am on the same bolt here and I am gonna go to the negative battery terminal. That's what I wanna see. This is the wire coming from the coil to the distributor and I've got it to ground. So we're not sending any sparks to the plugs. It's not gonna run, but let's crank it and make sure we have spark. All right, I'm testing the coil. Sorry about the beeping, nothing I can do about it. So it'll jump that gap when I ground this wire. This is how the system works. I've basically tapped into the module and I'm manually grounding the wire rather than using the regular mechanism. So let's see if it sparks. Yes. Okay. So that tells me there's only one thing left. There is a pickup sensor inside here and it should be intermittently sending a ground to the module. And if it were doing that, it would spark. We just proved that. Uh, so it must be not doing that. So let me pop this cap back off of here and we'll see what we can see under there. This guy right here. Yeah, the way this works, this, this rotates on a gear down inside the engine. And this is on a keyed shaft. There's a key there, so this can only go on one way. And these, there's eight of these little fins here. And as it goes by that sensor, it knows, okay, well, there's a cylinder. And then when it hits the airspace, it's okay, don't spark. And then when it hits this, it does spark. I don't know exactly when it sends the spark, but you get the point. This is spinning around through that sensor saying, hit, 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 hit. And what it's doing to say hit is grounding that wire. The wire, this one right here, that we just sent a ground to the coil and verified that it sparked. So it is not sending a ground through this wire like it should be. All right, took this thing apart. I'm not surprised it's not working. Could be as simple as like no connection, bridging that, uh, or, or maybe that. But on the other side, looks like we have a diode, a capacitor, and then I'm not sure what that is. But it looks pretty rough. Let me price a new one. That's probably the way to go. So this just came in the mail, and this should be the ignition sensor coil that I ordered. Yeah, I just waited days for this, and they sent me an empty package. <sighs> Whack-a-mole. They said the soonest they can get it to me now is Tuesday, which is today's Friday. Awesome. All right, it has been quite a bit over a week, actually. It took me a full week to get this part, and then I was in the middle of other things. And uh, we're finally ready to continue on now.
The wires don't match up exactly, but um, I think this is the correct part. I think the new parts uh, are actually better. I mean, you can see this thing is pretty exposed and it corroded. Uh, the new ones are potted. So hopefully this will last and um, make it spark. That's the main thing. Honestly, even though I was pretty confident in my troubleshooting, it's always nerve wracking with something like this. Because if it doesn't spark now, well, then I'm really going to have to rack my brain for a while. And I don't really feel like doing that. <laughs> Let's throw this thing in there and see what happens. have spark okay that's gratifying all right well let me get the water hooked up and we're gonna try to crank this thing up So yeah, I'm really kind of speechless here. I can't believe how well it's running. It's not smoking like crazy. It sounds good. It's even burning old gas. This gas is at least two years old. Can you believe that? I don't really believe it. In the back of my mind this whole time I've been thinking I'm wasting my time here. Listen to that. I got nothing to say. So guys, I think without a doubt, 
That's my greatest save to date. I really did not think this was going to be the result. I thought if I did get it running, it was going to be belching smoke like the 1010 was. Wow. Wow. This thing's ready for a season of boating. <laughs> I told my brother I was going to give his boat a name. I'm not sure if he believed me or not. Well, it's not perfect. <laughs> Nothing I do is. But, uh, fits the boat. <laughs> so now, the million dollar question is how did that water get in there? <sighs> the way I see it, there's two options. It's through the carburetor. My brother did say that this, this whole thing that was above it leaked. And he always kept this covered with a tarp. But if there was a hole in the wrong place of the tarp, and it was just dumping water right down the carburetor, that would do it. The other major possibility are the exhaust manifolds. Uh, the exhaust on a boat gets ejected out through the hull and that actually requires a little more engineering than you might initially think. You know, exhaust on a car is no big deal. You run it through a pipe and you, you exhaust it. Out the back, out the top, whatever. But on a boat, if you're going through the hull, you need a seal or your boat leaks. So to take the exhaust through the hull, you have to cool it first. So this, these things here are exhaust manifolds that have basically a water jacket surrounding the exhaust. And there's a gasket here, there's, you know, there's various seals on that system. And if those leak and water then, water then would run to the exhaust valves and be able to get into the cylinders. So that would be the other case. Although there was water on both sides. So either both exhaust manifolds failed simultaneously or it came in through the carburetor. One thing I'm thinking I'm going to do, I would like to look at the cylinders again, at least a few of them. If the exhaust manifolds are leaking, I should see water in those cylinders. And I, I suspect it's not the exhaust manifold, come to think of it. Because he said this thing ran fine all season. This is something that happened while it was in storage. So the exhaust manifolds, they would leak while they're in use, not, um, not while it's in storage. So yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know anything about boats, but this sucker runs. <laughs> Still can't believe it. Okay, I am going to scope the four easiest cylinders to get to where the plugs aren't blocked by this. And um, I wanna see if there's any water in there. That'll tell me it's coming from the exhaust manifold. Uh, and also I just wanna see how the cylinder walls look. Well, it certainly looks a lot better. Let's see if I can get back 
looking. Look at the valve. And there are the valves. Those look pretty good. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's such a huge improvement. There's no water on the cylinder, a little bit of oil. No surprise. Cylinder six was right at the top, so I barred the engine over to put it down. There's still some oil in there. There's a lot of staining. It looks kind of rough, but compared to before, this looks so much better. For comparison, this is the first time I scoped this cylinder. The engine was still locked up when I did this. <laughs> that looks horrid. And I scoped two more cylinders on the other side of the engine. These are the four cylinders that the spark plugs aren't horrible to get out. Uh, the others I'm going to leave alone. So overall, none of them look great. But honestly, I think this is going to clean up with use and get better with use and uh, it's running so well I think you ought to just run it I don't see any evidence of water in these things I really think it came through the carburetor but I'm not sure about that and I know there's a lot of guys out there that have a lot of experience with these engines what do you guys think since I'm here I'm gonna go ahead and check the compression I suspect it's gonna be fine because uh, the thing runs pretty well <laughs> About 110, just shy of 120. And we'll go ahead and check the second hole here. Better on that one, 130. So I suspect this is all gonna improve, but I am curious, like mechanics out there, I almost feel like putting, um, this is crazy to even say, but putting something abrasive into the, the cylinder and letting it kind of grind itself a little bit um, almost seems like it would help. All that pitting and everything from the water being in there would at least turn into a, a more smooth cylinder. Now that said, probably just leave it alone is the thing to do and let it wear itself in. I think it'll get better with time. Realistically, I think I think you ought to just go ahead and change out the uh, all the, the gaskets on the exhaust manifolds and but I'm, I'm probably going to leave that for him to do. <laughs> I've had enough with whack-a-mole. All right, I'm curious to see how this thing cranks now. I've got it in the off position, so it's not going to start. But let's just see if it cranks better. I mean, I guess it's a little better. Now yeah, let's see if it'll start. Starts right up. Well, that thing really runs amazingly well. <laughs> what do you think? Should I put it in the water? All I have is my pond around here. That would be actually uh, kind of funny and kind of ridiculous. There you go, guys. Actually got that thing running again. Uh, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really surprised and uh, pretty gratifying to save this thing from the scrap heap. I'm curious, you know, a regular mechanic, would they have gone that far or would they have just said, you need an engine rebuild or you need a new engine? Uh, as soon as they saw that engine was locked up and there was rust in the cylinders. There's still some more work to do on it. The exhaust manifolds probably ought to be changed and it probably needs a general tune-up. Some fresh fuel in the tank wouldn't hurt either. But at this point, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I'm done playing with whack-a-mole. 
I'm giving it back to my brother. He can take over from here. We're going to go on to the next project. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you on the next one. And I'm sure someone will ask, why don't I just use my truck? I could put it in the pond with my truck. I'd never get it out. There's no ramp. You have to pull it up a, a big rise and my truck would just spin. No chance. this morning.